Thanks to MPB for sponsoring today's video. As a photographer and videographer, the data I produce every single day is not even funny. Seriously, as soon as you go out and buy a camera, you should automatically be joined into the r slash data hoarder subreddit. But my fellow photo and video people, I need to tell you something. From the bottom of my heart, you make me incredibly nervous. Why is it that not a single one of my photographer friends has a proper backup strategy? Nope, it's always just flinging around external SSDs and hard drives like one of those artsy scarves you're only allowed to wear at photo exhibitions. But to be honest, I understand why. Backups are not exactly a very sexy investment compared to that lens you put in your cart before even getting the deposit for the gig. Yeah, I saw that. But the thing is, there are some lessons you just need to learn the hard way. You had a hard drive fail on you like last year, right? It was a, uh, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> and the, the thing is, that wasn't even the first time that's happened to me. So that's actually I, probably like what? my third, the third time I've um, experienced no hard drive failure. Yeah. Actually, wait, bro, you need to change something. <laughs> you you paid for like data recovery, right? Like I ended up paying thirty six thousand pesos, which is roughly around that's say maybe somewhere around oh, 600 yeah. euros the second time my hard drive failed they actually weren't able to recover it oh, um no. and then the last one was like i think the two years ago one where i started buying the big hard drives like the 12 terabytes 16 terabytes <laughs> so you decided right to thing. double down and i ended up by up paying like 1900 euros i think so to be fair, they recovered everything, but that's like 1,900. Yeah. I was 1, like, 1,900 oh euro. The thing with hard drives and SSDs is they fail kind of a lot. <laughs> and this is not one of those videos that only talk about backups because they're sponsored by a company that builds NAS devices. Actually, Synology has contacted me in the past asking to work with me, but this year Synology started to implement a vendor lock-in where they only allow first party Synology brand drives in their newer NAS systems, which is just plain silly. And I told them I'd gladly work with them if they ever decide to change their company policy on this. I don't think they're gonna change it just because of me though. <laughs> so it was time for me to to put my money where my mouth is. I put my own money and time into building the almost perfect DIY modular NAS. And now I'm not only gonna show you how to do it, but also the mistakes I made along the way that maybe you should avoid. <laughs> the idea is really simple. We of course need a hard drive to start, but not just one, ideally two with the same capacity so we can have the same data mirrored across them. If one of them fails, we can just swap it out and the other one still has all of the data on it. D data? D d data? The data doo doo? We also need a motherboard, a processor, some RAM, and an SSD to install the operating system on. You know, to do computer things. We also need a power supply to give all that sweet electricity to the components. And of course, we need a case to put everything into. So where do we start? I'm just gonna let fate decide. The main board, how convenient, because that's the only place that makes sense to start with. <laughs> My entire idea for this build actually came when I found these NAS mainboards on AliExpress, so I ordered one. <laughs> Nothing gives me more confidence in a product than a dented box like this one with the most generic name on it you could possibly imagine. These motherboards are super interesting because they are purpose-built to include a bunch of connectivity for hard drives and SSDs. The one I got has an Intel N150 processor built in, which is not very powerful, but the thing is we don't want to go for power. Actually, the opposite. It's easy to think that you could just use any old beefy computer for a home server, but if you live in the EU, like me, where electricity is actually crazy expensive compared to other parts of the world, it's not really worth it in a computer you want to have running 24-7. And it usually makes more sense to get something low power. Processor efficiency has really come a long way in the past 10 years, so it does make a lot of sense to Pay a bit more for something that is recent-ish. <laughs> At this point, I realized that the AliExpress seller actually forgot to ship the cooler with the motherboard, which I had paid extra for, but that's a problem for future Felix. Okay, let's roll the die again to see what we're gonna continue with. The case? I mean, we don't have all of the components yet, but yeah, okay, I guess. The case is actually the biggest challenge for this build, because ideally I want to 3D print it and make it modular, so I can expand with more drives in the future. Honestly, I just did this because at some point during the past few years my brain started to automatically translate suffering into learning experiences and problem solving is so fun. And now I like to overcomplicate things. Honestly, for most people it's easier to just buy a case 
that offers a bunch of drive bays. There are loads of them, like the Fractal Design Node 304, or there are some by a company called Johnsbow. Just do some research to find out what fits your needs and components. But if you're like me and like a DIY challenge, will use any excuse to fire up the 3D printer and would rather put in hours of work to save 80 bucks, here's what I came up with. After a while of searching for a good model online, I found a model for a case that looked like it would fit my components. So without measuring anything, I started the like 14 hour print. I am using PETG because it's more heat resistant than PLA, which already can start to melt above like 55 degrees Celsius or something like that. Ideally, this build will run very cool and you wouldn't even reach 55 degrees, but I would rather take some precautions to not have the case melt around all of the expensive components. <laughs> okay, let's do something else while it's printing for ages. Case again? No, like the, the printer is printing now. I don't actually have any RAM, but I know where I can find some. Yoink. And while we're here, why not shop for an SSD? Yoink. Let's install them on the motherboard. Zzz, screwdriver sound effect. Let's see what Chance tells us to do next. The case again? No, it's still printing. We're doing power supply. Power supply is a crucial part of this build because normal computer power supplies are very big and we want to make this small. Luckily, they make small form factor power supplies for people who have beards and think coffee plus paying double for computer parts is a personality. Also, they're usually built for very powerful components and can deliver hundreds of watts of power, but all of our components will only draw like 20 watts. I was racking my brain for a while until a friend suggested I get a Pico PSU. I had no idea these existed. These are basically just the bare minimum of connectors you need for a computer and they take power from an external 12 volt power supply which is perfect because it keeps our build way smaller and they are way cheaper plus offer much better efficiency at these lower wattages compared to the stuff people buy you pretend they can taste which llama pooped out the bean that went into their espresso you just need to connect the cpu header and the big atx connector which for some reason didn't really want to fit i just got some smooth jazz out and started to explain my newest app idea to really give that failing business major at a party vibe. Yeah, it's like Tinder, but for actionable business insights. Yeah, I'm looking for funding right now. What do you mean you're a broke college student and don't want to invest? Oh, look at that. It just went in by itself. By the way, there are four pins that aren't connected, but it's fine. Those are only needed for much more powerful components. Okay, let's see what the dice say. Case? Okay, let's see if the print is done. After like 14 hours of printing, I realized it didn't actually fit my components. Let's continue with something that's easier, maybe, because this is no fun. Case again? Okay, fine. Let's not immediately ignore a problem as soon as we hit the first little bump, which is my strong suit. The biggest problem was my 3D printer is pretty small. It's literally the cheapest one Bamboo Lab sell. There were so many cases I found online that looked really cool but just wouldn't fit my printer. It has a print bed size of 18 by 18 centimeters. Luckily, a standard ITX motherboard like the one the dented box produced is 17 by 17, so not a lot of leeway to work with. Literally hours of searching later, I finally found a design on Thingiverse that looked really good and most importantly was modular. The notes on it were pretty confusing though. In the end, there's basically gonna be two identical size blocks, one on top of the other, with the bottom one having all of the components and the top one only having the hard drives, which are mounted into this part. Anyway, I started printing. <laughs> okay, while the printer is doing its thing again, let's go work on something else. What? Seven? Oh, it's today's sponsor. MPB, my favorite place to buy and sell used camera gear. If you're looking for an upgrade or just some extra cash to build out your art slash home lab wet dreams, MPB is the place to go because they're a platform that buys equipment from photographers like you tests it, photographs it from all sides, and then finds it a new home. It's a circular economy. It's really good for the environment. They actually have really good prices, in some cases lower than on popular used marketplaces, but you don't have to deal with weird buyers or sellers, and most importantly, you actually get a warranty on all of the gear you buy, no matter how old it is. You can literally buy 15-year-old DSLRs and get a warranty on it, which is 
crazy. That's why I was already using and recommending MPB years before they became a sponsor of the channel. So if you've got some gear sitting on a shelf that's just collecting dust and you'd rather trade it in for something new or cold hard cash, get a quote from them right now at the first link down in the description. Well, it's not really cold hard cash if you didn't really have to do that much to get it, right? Maybe like lukewarm soft cash? Okay, back to the video. <laughs> I swear, if it's Case again, motherfuck. Well, luckily, through the magic of video, I could speed up the days of printing and waiting for parts to arrive. A little rudimentary test fit showed me that it kind of fits-ish. The biggest problem was that the front and back plates just barely didn't fit on my printer, literally missing like a millimeter on every side. I tried to print them diagonally and vertically with a bunch of supports, but the quality really suffered when doing that. So I got a friend to yoink some company resources and print it for me at his work. That way he could also make this super cool multicolor print with my logo and the quality is way better. I also added this little power button cutout in CAD which doesn't exist in the original files and it took me way longer than I want to admit because it was my first time using CAD, but like, I, I made a hole, okay? I'm really proud of that. I just winked the placement, let's hope it fits. <laughs> the way this entire case is going to be assembled is with screws, but screwing straight into plastic kinda sucks, especially if you need to take it apart and put it together a bunch of times. That's why a lot of 3D printed projects use heated inserts. These are metal round bits that have screw threads on the inside, and you basically just get a soldering iron to melt these into the plastic. I've never used these before, so I was a bit nervous about this, especially after spending so much time on printing everything. Thing. To my surprise, this was actually super easy. It worked incredibly well. You don't really have to do that much. It's super satisfying. Within like 15 minutes, I had installed all of the inserts and after a bit of test fit and installing the power button, the case was basically ready. But before we assemble everything inside the case, it's a very good idea to test the components before you spend all the time of cramming them inside the case. So with the ethically sourced SSDs and RAM installed, I connected the 12 volt power supply to the PSU and hooked up a camera monitor with HDMI because that was quicker than taking a monitor from my desk for some reason and that's how you know that I'm a videographer. <laughs> but I had already installed the power button on the case and I didn't feel like hooking that up now so luckily I found a diagram on the AliExpress page that shows which pins are the ones for the power button. So I just bridged those two pins with my screwdriver and it started right up. I had a USB stick with the true NAS installer plugged in and we're gonna talk more about operating systems later. But when I started the installer no drives showed up. I was confused. After like an hour or two, I gave up and sent the seller a message asking, is it possible the M.2 slots on the motherboard only support NVMe SSDs, which the seller then confirmed a while later. The SSDs I installed did have the right connector, but they were SATA SSDs, which is a different protocol than NVMe. So that's definitely something to keep in mind if you're going to order one of these boards. So I ended up ordering a normal 120 gigabyte SATA SSD, which, yeah, same protocol, but different connector. <laughs> that way I don't have to deal with the M.2 slots. It was under 10 euro, which is insane, considering I paid like 60 or 70 bucks for one of these like 10 years ago. I also ordered a low profile thermal ride cooler that fits this motherboard for 20 bucks because I didn't have the time for the seller to ship the replacement from China for the one they forgot. This cooler is honestly way too good for this measly 7 watt CPU, but whatever. It was the cheapest one that was small enough to fit in the case. We already have all important components on the motherboard, so let's install the CPU cooler. We need to use the mounting hardware for the LGA1150 socket though. The cooler actually came with some thermal paste, so I just gave a generous serving. The quality of the thermal paste really doesn't matter for this weak ass CPU. Also don't forget to plug in the CPU cooler's fan. One important thing to keep in mind is that the Pico PSU only comes with one SATA power connector, so I got a four-way splitter to connect my two drives. I connected the SSD and everything, plugged in the keyboard, booted it up and was finally able to install true NAS and I guess Bob's now my uncle? Well there's nothing left to do now than to pop the IO shield into the case and to start violently shoving fragile electronics into the case. Screwing in the motherboard screws was very annoying because the screw holes were very hard to get to. I ended up using this tiny allen key because it was the only thing that would fit. I also didn't get all screws in, some were just too hard to get to. It's not like I'm going bungee jumping with this thing, it, it's fine, it's fine. 
I screwed the SSD into the top plate and slid it into place. Now we can start screwing in the hard drives into the bottom plate of the upper half. Oh, I just realized that I never told you about the hard drives. I got two Seagate Exos X22 drives, which have 22 terabytes each and are factory recertified. Getting used drives might not sound like a good idea, but actually they can offer incredible value. You gotta be careful where you buy them from though. I got these ones from Amazon and they had good reviews. And most importantly, they were half of the price of new ones. Both of these hard drives together cost 540 euro, which still is a lot of money, but luckily I have that Patreon on money to offset 1 18th of the cost. I used the website to find this deal. It shows you which listings give you the cheapest price per terabyte and this was super helpful. I'm gonna put these two hard drives into a mirrored configuration for redundancy giving me 22 terabytes of usable storage. The Thingiverse build shows photos of some rubber holes around the screws that go into the hard drives. I'm guessing for vibration dampening but I don't have any rubber holes. It's, it's fine, it's fine. With the top case for the hard drives assembled, I stacked it on top of the other one and started routing cables. These random SATA cables I had were way too long though, which made it really annoying. I would recommend you buy some shorter low profile ones if you want to replicate this build. But then I had a much bigger problem. The only thing that was missing was to add the front plate to the top and it just would not fit. The SATA connectors were just pointing out the front too far. I was really frustrated because I knew I had to finish this today because it was like 3 a.m. and I knew in the morning I had to pack up a bunch of stuff and move it out of my apartment because I was going back to Italy and I'm subletting the apartment. So all of the mess I had created up until this point, I also had to clean up before leaving. So in a last hurrah, I went to harvest some more cables from an old computer and my actual desktop PC in the hopes that I would find anything to make this fit. I found an L-shaped SATA cable for the top drive, but that would not work for the bottom drive. Luckily, I found a cable that was a bit more flexible, which allowed me to finally squeeze the front on and close the case with a decent amount of force. But eh, it's, it's fine, it's fine. And then I had to take everything apart again because I forgot to plug in the power button. And that's it, at like 3.30 a.m. we're finally done. I ended up zip tying an 80mm fan I had laying around to the side to give the drive some more airflow. So let's talk about what it's going to cost you to build this. I already had the RAM and some stuff like cables laying around, but you can also order the motherboard together with RAM if you don't have any. The entire build costs under 300 euro, which also includes an M.2 NVMe drive. TrueNAS actually needs a separate drive for applications that is not the boot drive, which I didn't know before, and which I need to add once I'm back in Germany at the top secret facility facility where this machine is deployed. You also need about 30 bucks of materials, which include a box of screws and a box of heated inserts, but you can print the entire thing with well under a kilogram of filament, which is very nice. The two drives cost me about 540 euro. In the end, this entire project was not cheap, but it's definitely below what I would have paid for an off-the-shelf solution. You might say, but for about 300 bucks, you can also get an off-the-shelf 2-bay NAS. That is true, but those are all wildly underpowered, have basically no RAM compared to the 16 gigs in my build, and most importantly, offer no upgradability or expandability for the hardware. I can easily switch out and upgrade components, and especially scale vertically. No, I, I mean like physically, I can just stack more hard drives on top. I'm not a huge fan of TrueNAS though. For my use, it's fine, but I also have a computer science degree and I can't expect every one of you to have that. There is a a really nice video by Hardware Haven where he walks you through the entire TrueNAS setup, which I'm gonna link below, but I think for a lot of people Unraid might be the better choice. I've never used it and decided to cheap out when I heard you need to buy a license for it, but I've heard it's much more user friendly and I'm thinking I might give it a try after all. Okay, that's it. This was a pretty long project, I put a lot of time and money into it, so if you liked it please consider subscribing. Also here's a video where I spent like way too much time building five apps for photographers because Adobe wouldn't. See you in the next one. Bye-bye!